everyone and welcome back to the Limitless Potential Show. I'm your host, Vanessa Jane Patrick, and today we have incredible available for you. We are discussing narcissistic self-defense with the world's only recovering narcissist, Larry White. So today's episode is definitely for you if you have ever suffered from narcissistic abuse, if you have ever wondered whether a narcissist can actually ever recover, um, and if you'd like to learn some narcissistic self-defense from someone who's been on the other side and uh, can teach you a lot. So let me introduce you quickly, just uh, read a little bit of a bio from Larry White so you have a bit of an idea about who you're going to be um, diving into the wisdom of today. So back in 2019, Larry White decided to write a book about his life, much of which has been dominated by a personality disorder. In 1993, with the help of his wife, Christina, he came to realize that he had NPD or narcissistic personality disorder. When he read the nine characteristics of the disorder, he realized that NPD explained why his life had been so unsatisfactory. Understanding that he had NPD and changing his personality to eliminate it were two very different insights. It was 21 years later in 2015 that Larry was able to shed his disorder and stop manifesting NPD. His book, Confessions of a Zen Narcissist, Struggles with the Illusion of Self, is the account of Larry's life with NPD and how he, has, he was finally able to be rid of the disorder. It's honest, revealing, and a deeply personal account that demythologizes and explains a personality disorder from a perspective rarely seen, that of a recovering narcissist. And you can find his amazing book on Amazon. So let's get into it and let me introduce you to Larry and uh, let's dive into his amazing wisdom. How are you, Larry? Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. I've been so excited to have you on the show. Uh, many of the listeners and followers know my uh, struggle with having a conversation around narcissism purely because I think the, the word and the term gets thrown around so much. You know, oh, they're a narcissist. Oh, you got to protect yourself from a narcissist. And, um, and we can be very black and white in kind of the collective consciousness going around where it's like you're a narcissist or you're being abused by a narcissist. And I don't personally, I haven't liked those terms too much because I feel like the whole premise of Limitless Potential and this show is not limiting people's growth. And actually, you know, accessing your potential without the limitations from the external world or from your own limiting beliefs. So I was really interested in diving into this one with you. Um, and before we dive into all the amazing questions and wisdom um, and so forth, I would love to start with asking you, what are you most grateful for in your life right now? What am I most grateful for? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very grateful for the fact that I was able, after all of those years, to discover what was bothering me. Because from the time I was in college, uh, well, before that, I mean, as, as early as I can remember, something was wrong, and I it just didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a long time to uh, get to the point where I could uh, deal with it. And uh, uh, so that's what I'm really most grateful for in my life, that that. Uh, having spent a lot of most of my life very unsatisfactorily for myself and other people that I can have emerge on the other side and uh, uh, have them, what I'm hopeful that I can do uh, because I may not be the world's only recovering narcissist <laughs> and if there's any out there I'd love to talk to you give me a call <laughs> but uh, there aren't very many and if I as a result of my experience can be helpful to other people either who are living or working with a narcissist I'd like to do that I'm not under any illusion that I can really help somebody who's a full-blown narcissist mm. because they don't have any problems. They're not going to listen to me or anybody else, yeah. but we can talk about that. Okay. This is going to be really interesting and I can't wait to dive into that with you. And um, you were mentioning just briefly before we actually started our live today that you were really grateful that you feel like your life was saved 
um, by making That's this right. trend. And so I'd love to start with, and this is going to be quite a long, so you take your time answering this, but you're a very unique um, guest to have on the show. And uh, like, like mentioned in your bio, it's quite rare to get the perspective of somebody who has recovered from narcissistic personality disorder because, like I mentioned, it's mostly taught you cannot recover. And uh, you kind of gave a little bit of a maybe an insight into maybe not everybody can recover potentially from um, your perspective with this. But I'd love to just start with hearing from you a little bit more about your journey. I know you've written an entire book on it that we'll all be interested in diving into. But what was life like before you discovered you had a narcissistic personality disorder? How did you come to acknowledge that you even had it? And what's that recovery process kind of looked like? And, and how do you know you've gotten there? There's a lot of, lot of questions in that. A lot of questions there. <laughs> well, I think, I, I think the, the basic thing is that I knew, I knew that there was something, something really troubling me. And so when I, when I went to college, um, I was introduced to uh, Alan Watts and uh, – uh, he came and he came and spent a weekend with us at, at Deep Springs College, where I went. And um, so he was he was er, one of the early American. Well, he wasn't an American, but he was in America. Uh, one of the early guys in in Zen. So I got involved in Zen, and I and, and I guess I thought that might be the way I could uh, get beyond my discomfort. I, I just felt that there, I was looking for something. Mm -hmm. So I I struggled with that and. Um, but the, it manifested in interesting ways. I never could really attach and get and get involved in anything. I, my, I had a great experience with Deep Springs College in California, which was a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I was very successful there. And uh, uh, but then I went off. To, that that was only a, a, a two and a half year experience, uh, and then I went off to finish college at Pomona College, and that was a great school. But I never. I was always as though I was never involved. I was never, I, I could never get in, in, attached to anything. I just sort of coasted along. And, and, and this, this went on for years and years. I, I would take a job. I was really good at interviewing. I could, I could sit down and interview for a job and it was great. But then I had to, then I had to uh, go and, and, practice, and be on the job and that wasn't so good. <laughs> and I, I, I just, I, I was never, I was never successful. I could get, I, I got jobs and I, and I, I did things. I was usually in, in, in some sort of administrative role, but it, it, it would last for a, for a few years. And I would either walk away or get fired. <clears throat> Early experience with a, my one of my first experiences with a therapist. When I got to Pomona College, I found the therapist, and I said, "You know, there's something going wrong here." Well, <clears throat> he talked to me for a while. Now that was before narcissistic personality disorder had been identified and recognized. It was not. On the uh, the the, the uh, uh, diagnostic statistical manual of um, medical uh, disorders. So, but he said to me, "Look," he said, what, "Whatever is wrong with you, you're never going to be hospitalized or anything like that." But he said, "What you're probably going to do is move from one thing to another thing and never feel satisfied," and that was true. Uh, so to, to compact this a little, and this went on for a long time. I had a lot of good opportunities and. One way or another, I either walked away from them or got fired. And finally, uh, in I, I, I was um, married to Willow for a while and we got divorced, not for anything that she did wrong, but just because I was constantly looking for something else. And then I then I married Christina, and um, uh, Christina finally uh, confronted me in uh, 19 uh, but 1993. She she was seeing a therapist for her own reasons. And she came to the conclusion that I was a narcissist. I had NPD. She didn't tell me that, but she did tell her therapist that. So the therapist said, okay, well, why don't you have him come in and I'll talk to him? Well, I'd been through years of therapy myself, and it was not unusual for somebody who's in therapy to say, well, my therapist wants to meet you. So fine. So I went and met her. And then she confirmed to Christina that I was probably a narcissist. And she said, don't confront him. It's not going to work. It's only going to ruin your relationship. Just you can't confront him. Well, fortunately, Christina didn't accept that. So I'm sitting there in, in our living room one evening, and she said, there's some stuff I want you to read. She gave me the DSM-5, which was about a two-and-a-half-page description of narcissism, and I read it. 
and there's nine characteristics. And I read, and then, and I, if you have five of those, then you're you have the disorder. Yeah. And I read those, sat there and read those, and I literally broke out in a cold sweat. And and I started I started having these remembrances of all these kind of activities that I had over my lifetime. And I said, my God, that hits the nail on the head. I really am a narcissist. And so I fully accepted it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the interesting thing is that that's only the beginning of the problem. So I accepted it intellectually. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's me. I got the whole nine characteristics. Mm -hmm. But what do you do then? Well, I was about to be fired from one job at that point, And I, offer, I was offered a, another job in, in uh, Alexandria, Louisiana, as a, as a uh, chief executive officer of the hospital. So I wasn't able to follow through with Christina's therapist or anything like that. I went out, I, I, I went to Louisiana where I am now. And I, I knew I was a narcissist. But the interesting thing was intellectually, I knew I was a narcissist. What I didn't realize, of course, was that I was still fully manifesting narcissism. <laughs> so, so I didn't, I wasn't successful at this job and I got, I, I, I finally got fired from it. And, that went on for, it wasn't until 2015. Uh, in the meantime, I'd been, I'd been continuing to practice my Zen, and I had been very, very, uh, very interested in the whole, in the whole problem of, of uh, self. I was really obsessed with the whole issue of self. That, you know, this, was a, this seemed to me to be at the heart of the, of the issue about Zen. Zen is in dropping the illusion of self. Well, one evening, I was standing in my kitchen and I had this experience, which I really, it's hard to describe, but it was, it was, it was a both, it was both visual and elsewhere that this, I, that somehow this, this self of mine was, was merging into the, into the bigger concept of mind or whatever. It, it, it was a feeling of, that it was, it was dropping from the experience that I'd had. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think too much about it until the next day when I, I was out the, with Christina, and I suddenly realized that my whole perception was different. Uh, we we had a uh, a, a big trip, a, a big store where you went for help, for recreational supplies, uh, craft supplies. And I never liked the store. I thought it was kind of crazy and kind of kooky, and uh, so I, it was. It, I thought it was kind of a it, kind of Pentecostal. They're playing all this crazy music, and all these people are wearing long dresses, and I. I I went there with my wife, who was in, a, in an electric cart because she had problems with her back. And so she would be in her electric uh, uh, chair and driving along. And I would be behind her with the, with the uh, basket, putting the stuff that she wanted to buy in the basket. And we w went through this enormous store. We started back toward the counter. And I looked around and I said, this place feels different. This is really a very attractive store. And all these women that who, who said, they, they look like very nice people. They're just kind of here doing their Christmas shopping. I had a completely different feeling. For the first time in my life, I, I empathized with other people. And I, and I discovered that when I, I walked in the mall every every day, and the next day when I walked in the mall, I'd always been very, very condescending and critical of all of these overweight people. And living here at Alexandria, you don't probably don't experience this much in, in uh, 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 Argentina. No. Australia. Yep. Australia, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, but here it's a big deal. So I was always kind of quietly uh, condescending of all of these. And I, I walked through and I thought, my God, these people, these people are very brave to be, you know, here. And I, I just felt a lot of, of empathy for them. Anyway, long, long story short, that experience resulted in some ma major changes. My people who knew me, uh, could, could, I had... I had participated in starting a Zen group, and I was very obnoxious in starting it, as though I knew all the answers. And, and uh, suddenly, I was seeing it in a whole different way. So, uh, the people who knew me saw that there was a, a major personality change. So, to simplify that long harangue, was I had an experience of intellectually recognizing that I had the disorder, and then finally, largely as a result of my my Zen activity, I think I had an experience. Which I, in which I was able to drop the, the, the disorder. And I, don't, I think there's lots of different ways people can have that experience, but I think that the things that are important for people to understand, that if, there's, there's three things that are important. If, you're, if, you have, if you have a narcissistic personality disorder like I did, and I don't think it was mixed with anything else. I wasn't 
I wasn't psycho sociopathic or psychopathic or anything like that. It was really pretty much straight narcissism. And anybody who reads the book, I think, would agree that it was pretty clearly narcissism and not a lot of other things. Uh, the first step is, is to, to hit bottom. And that's the problem. Most narcissists don't hit bottom. They just uh, continually feel that they're special. I had gotten to the point where I was open to somebody saying, hey, you got a problem. So I, I accepted the fact that I had a problem. But then there's also kind of a muscle memory. You're, you're still acting out the same way. So, so how do you get to the point of, of dropping all of that? And that's, that's the real name of the game. And I, I think that I, I had an experience which is really based on my Zen Buddhism. But at this point in my life, I think somebody, if they came to the conclusion that, they've had, had the, that they had the disorder, I think if they got into some in-depth psychotherapy for, for a long period of time, not just a few sessions, or through their Christianity, if they got into, the, into some, some deep uh, metaphysical sides of that, some real contemplative stuff, or through Buddhism or something like that, where they have, are able to have an experience of, of changing their personality, of dropping the illusion of self. I think, I think that the, the one contribution that I think I can make from my experience is to point out that the whole illusion of a separate self is very, very poisonous. And I think you can put it on a continuum. At the, at the, at the, continu at the worst end continuum on the left is the narcissist who feels that, that his, his self, his ego, is all there is. He, that's all there is in the world. He's not out to get anybody. He's not out to hurt anybody. He just, all he sees is his own ego. And he doesn't he doesn't realize this because it's kind of he, he, he's not open to to what his illusion is because his illusion is his reality. So at the at the left hand side of the continuum, you've got the narcissist with the with, with the, the really strong sense of self. At the other end of this continuum, you've got what what we've all called uh, enlightenment. I'm not enlightened. But when people are enlightened, they really totally drop the illusion of self, the whole illusion of self. So it's a continuum. But in the between, in, the, in between those two extremes, people have an opportunity to to, to modify and mitigate the, the, the illusion of self, which allows them to be more open, more more creative. Um, that's at the heart of all of the religions, by whatever sense, that you've got to get away from yourself, away from your ego. And I think that's... That's the name of the game. How do you do that? Well, there are lots of ways to do that. But those three, those three aspects, I think, are important. Hit bottom, intellectually recognize it, and then, through, what it, through whatever means, have an epiphany on which can you drop the, the illusion that, you, that you've been living with and are able then to begin to grow in, in another way without this uh, strong, uh, illusory self. Mm -hmm. Now, Long-winded answer to your question, but no, it's amazing. It You've shared so much, and I've I've literally just taken a whole page of notes, like and just everything oh, that good. just came yeah. out because, yeah. um, no, this is absolutely fascinating for myself, and I know everybody listening because it's a topic that goes under the radar. And um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm everybody listening to this show are, are people who believe in breaking through the limitations placed upon us by you know, society or whoever, um, and or parents or whatever. But one key question, I've got a billion I want to ask you, but one key question um, I wanted to ask you, when I did a little bit of research, and by no means do I know really anything about narcissism, um, but I wanted to ask you and present you with this question to see its validity. But um, I've heard that uh, narcissism um, can be stemming from childhood um, post-traumatic stress. So um, in other words, uh, some a trauma happening as a child um, that, you know, you, you learn this strategy of creating this persona um, that, you know, is like a survival mechanism that show, makes you show up in this narcissistic, with these narcissistic traits and a way of overcoming um, or, or recovering from narcissism would be to go back to, I guess, what you mentioned, like the psychotherapy or, um, you know, going back to those 
um, traumatic experiences and recovering those past experiences in order to move on with um, that kind of dropping away of the old protective self and stepping into um, a new way of being, like you would say in that epiphany stage potentially. But does that does that resonate? Is there any truth to that? Or I, close. Here's here's okay. here's what I think is important. I don't think it's PTSD. I don't think it could. It's, it doesn't come from trauma. What it comes from, interestingly enough, I think by and large it comes from a good family. A family that, that that appears to be happy and working. It doesn't come from it doesn't come from tragedy. What it comes from, I think, uh, and not it, there's several different kinds, but the kind that I that I had, I think, is the call that the golden child kind. And and what what the theory I think is, if I understand it, is that you have a woman who was married to a man who doesn't meet her needs. Now, this is not, we're not talking about sexuality now, but the yeah. first, the guy just isn't the man she she wants. So she becomes the the alpha in the in the, in the the family. If she has a, she, she then has a firstborn son in my case. And so without even realizing it probably, she, she uh, attempts to create in her son the kind of man she wished she had married. Wow. And so it, it all seems very benign. It all seems very positive, except that this guy is raised to be the golden guy. He's he's the guy who who is special. He's the guy who can who, who's who can do no do no uh, uh, do no harm. It's all, yeah. and and when it, it, it ends up with an inability to be compassion to be empathetic. I remember very very at a very young age, my father used to say, you, "You're not you're not loving," and and I didn't know what he was talking about. And when I went to work with the Quakers, of all people, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, because they are so much into loving and compassion and everything. But I, I was so a marketing person for the National Institute of Mental Health on uh, in, in Washington D.C., which is a Quaker lobby, and uh, I was confronted there. You don't seem to have, any, you don't seem to be loving. Well, I think, it, I think that that it it definitely comes from childhood. I think it always comes from childhood, but it doesn't come from a child uh, from a from a. It's a dysfunctional family, but it's not a dysfunctional family that's obvious to everybody else. Nobody's getting beaten up. There's no sexual dis no sexual inappropriateness. It's very subtle. Mm -hmm. But what it is is this person who grows up. He's, he's he is raised to be special, mm -hmm. in, in a certain kind of way that distorts his whole perspective. In other words, he's he, he we all have, as as children we all are, the, the the concept of self is very very important. To grow up and to be a, 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 a an adult, you've got to go through the whole ego thing and it's a development. But at some point, you've got to merge beyond that. And uh, I think that as a result of that childhood experience, that that childhood self becomes the reality. There's nothing else. Nobody else that matters except that self. And then there's the struggle. And I think this is very important. It's not satisfying. And and there's a there's a sense of in inadequacy and, and inferiority even though you're acting the other way so you're you're constantly looking for something and and and, and i think many narcissists then try to find it in, in power and in in in, in, the, in their uh, activities with other people they're they're kind of trying to get them convince the world to convince them that they're all right mm. but your question was if it comes from a family yes it comes from the family but it comes from a family that appears to be nice and loving, it's, yeah. I don't think that, the, that that what creates the narcissist is going to be very obvious to the outside person. It's a much much more subtle than that. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. And a question again that just popped up based on your story and what you shared just then was um, because I, I think we can see this and we can um, perceive this in others when we um, see that somebody has a challenge of any variety. And then they have enablers around them that kind of enable that that kind of behavior. But it sounds like what you shared, it was your wife, Christina, who she challenged you. Like she had the guts to not enable but or not to run away. That's right. That's right. She, she challenged right. you. So um, could, you, could you share, do, do you feel like a narcissist would need a challenger in their life in order to... Um, provide some waking up or or do you see narcissists kind of surrounding themselves with um, enablers or their narcissistic fuel supply which it's termed 
I think the reason that, that therapists don't see narcissists very often, and that we joke about my being the world's only recovering narcissist, <laughs> which is a joke, by the way. I, when, when, when my marketing friends pointed that out to me, I said, my God, that's narcissistic. I don't want that. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a joke. Anyway, yeah. the, 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 the reason that that is even available is that uh, most narcissists that people have known at least see themselves as successful. They're surrounded by enablers that are, that are encouraging them. They don't, they don't hit bottom. For whatever reason, I, I was not successful and not happy. And so when she, and, and, and she and I were very close and, and very, I trusted her a great deal. And when she confronted me with this and said, look, this is you, I was able to open up and look at it and say, yeah, that's me. And that's important. But the other thing that is important is that to say, yeah, I got narcissistic personality disorder, it, that doesn't mean it just suddenly goes away. No. That means, okay, now I'm going to have to find out how to drop this. And I think people are, are listening to this. If, if, if they know somebody, I'm not suggesting and I'm, I'm, I, that, that anybody who's listening to this discussion is going to be able to confront a narcissist and, and have any success. I never have expected that in, in writing this book that I would be able to help narcissists. I hope I can help people who have to live with narcissists. Or Now, there's one thing other that I, I need to say, yep. and that is that when, I, when, when um, Christina presented me with this, uh, this uh, uh, the DSM-5, the uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, um, which describes narcissism in about two pages, I read that. I didn't then study up on narcissism, mm -hmm. and I sort of spontaneously decided one evening that I was going to write a book, which is another story, and I just started writing it. And I never read about narcissism, and I didn't, and, and it's very important that I didn't, because when I wrote that book, I didn't have any knowledge about what it was, what, what, what it was about or what people thought about it, except for those nine characteristics in the DSM-5. Had I known something about it, I probably wouldn't have written a book, because I would have said, well, I'm not like that, or I'm not this, whatever. I'm, I'm really looking at all of these diagnoses and discussions. I didn't have, when I wrote the book, I simply wrote my experience. So somebody who wants to say, well, he's not really a narcissist. Okay, read the book and maybe you'll think I'm not. I am what I am in that book. That was just, that, that, that was not contaminated by any knowledge on my part. Mm. After I wrote the book, then I began to go back and read some books about what other people thought about narcissism. And one of the things that I thought, uh, that I it seemed to me that, that a lot of the people who are writing books about it were mixing up narcissism and psychopathy or sociopathy, and they're different. And and and, and I think they have to be and they have to be looked at differently. I don't think that the sociopathy was any part of my experience. Mine was, I think, a pretty pure NPD. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm talking about is that. And, and the other thing oh, the, that you haven't asked this question yet, but I want to make sure I get this in. One of the things that I think is, is really important and that I can be helpful about is if somebody is working with or living with a narcissist and, they're saying, and they feel like they're beating, beaten up, I think it's important to realize that if they really are an MPD and we haven't got a whole lot of other things going on there, they're, they're not concerned about beating up somebody else. All they're doing is living the world, living in the, the world the way they see it, and and they're going to make it very difficult for other people, but not intentionally. I don't think there's an intentional desire to make life difficult for anybody else. I think they're struggling to experience life on their own. But because of the grandiosity and the and and the lack of empathy and all of those other nine characteristics, which I can read if you want me to. Yeah. Um, well, the, it, just quickly then, the, the, the nine characteristics are grandiosity, fantasies of power and success, belief in being special, demand for admiration, uh, exploitation of others, a lack of empathy, uh, envy of others or suspicion of envy of others, and arrogance. Now, you, you can manifest all of those things and, and make it very difficult for somebody to live with you. But I, if you're living with a narcissist, I, it seems to me it's important to realize they're, they're struggling with their own problems and they can be a real pain in the ass, but they're not, they're not out to get you. Now, there are other kinds of, uh, of disorders that I don't pretend to have any, any knowledge of, except to say that 
certainly a psychopath, a psychopath is going to have a different approach and may very well want to manipulate you. This is this is not characteristic of the NPD unless unless he has both. And so if you if you if you're living with or working with a person who's really a narcissistic personality person and doesn't have any other comorbidities, then he's not out to get you. He's just he, just living his life. He's just extremely difficult. Now, if if I if you're in that situation, it seems to make it much easier to live with somebody who's uncomfortable, unpleasant, and hard to live with because of what he's doing, but not because he's out to get you. I think that's an important distinction. Oh, I'm so grateful that you mentioned that because um, I, personally, I don't know though that that distinction, and I think most people don't, and we put people in this box of. Oh, they they are out to get you. Narcissists narcissists need to bring people down to feel grandiose and feel better about themselves. So I really appreciate you um, sharing that distinction for people, and also sharing those common characteristics. Um, and I, I know this is a big part of um, what you're passionate about doing with your work is helping and supporting people who may be dealing with a narcissist in their life. So. Starting with that key element, who are you dealing with here? Is it potentially pure narcissism or is there, um, you know, that other element um, coming into play? Um, where, where would, What would you say to people who may um, suspect that their partner is a narcissist or struggling with that and they want some sort of change in order to save the relationship or the dynamic? I, I don't really know how to be helpful with with that, I think I think that that um, a person needs needs to understand wh whom they're dealing with in this situation. Their their partner or their their work partner. Uh, if reading if reading my book is helpful, it, it's only going to be helpful in, in helping them identify what what the problem is. Uh, I think I think it's going to be un very unusual if somebody who is working with a narcissist or living with a narcissist is going to be able to change that narcissist. And I'm not suggesting that I can do it, and I'm not suggesting that most people can do it. Yeah. If, if reading my book or, or listening to me or talking to me is going to help you figure out how to live with this person, fine. It may just make you decide you want to just bail out and not live with this person. Uh, th this is a very, very difficult personality disorder, and I, I'm not suggesting there's any easy and ha happy way to solve it. Mm -hmm. But there, it is possible for people to feel more comfortable but by knowing more about it. So yeah. I'm not a diagnostician. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a therapist. I'm a person who had had, a, had an experience. And I wrote about the experience. And the experience is somewhat unusual. And if this, if my experience can help other people, then it's, then it's worthwhile. The other thing that I may be able to help people with is to point out the, the, the importance of recognizing that whole illusion of a, of a permanent and, and separate self, which is an illusion, which is at the heart of all of the religions in the world and uh, an issue that people have to deal with or choose not to. Uh, but, but certainly from the Buddhist point of view, that is the added, that, that is the, the core of suffering. Suffering comes from manifestation of that, of that separate ego. And certainly my experience has, has been of recognizing an experience from the from from the negative end, I have not had enlightenment, so I can't tell you what that's like. But I know that my experience of self has been modified and mitigated and and changed in a positive direction as a result of, of this uh, of, of dropping the the uh, the disorder. So mm. I don't know. There, yeah, I, I I just think that yeah, we 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 can we can make it easier for people who have to work with them, but. A narcissist is most most therapists, people who are maybe people who are listening to this will recognize and agree they've never met a narcissist. No, they never come to be treated. Uh, they are they're not going to be. Most therapists would say even if they came into my office, I don't know what I do with it. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not suggesting there's any magic about dealing with the narcissist. Yeah. How many of them? Are, how many of them really reach bottom and have somebody who's caring and empathy and empathetic enough? To help them when they if and when they do reach bottom is not going to be a very large group. Mm, 
Okay. And so I appreciate your um, transparency with that and your perspective on that. And also there's so much I'd love to dive into with you because I know you've got such wisdom in the area of, you know, dropping the illusion of self. And I'd love to hear more about um, Zen and what you go into with that. Um, But a question that I have for you, because I see this common theme, um, particularly when I work with people with relationships and the work that I do, and it's so common that people identify as being an empath an empath, and they're always attracting narcissists. And do you have, has it been kind of your personal experience or um, your, um, what you've experienced and seen in others to see this dynamic of almost extremism? So potentially a narcissist who's got barely any empathy, if any at all, um, attracting somebody who's extremely empathic um, or empathetic, and it's kind of like the, maybe even the only type of person that that nas- who could be in relationship with that narcissist um, because they can be so understanding of this challenging um, personality trait or disorder, I should say. But um, have you seen that theme, or what's your experience with that? I think I experienced that in in Christina, my my wife. Uh, is no, she died four years ago, but I, we were together for 43 years. And I think that she was extremely em, uh, empathic. She, yeah. she, she could, she had great empathy and great insight. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, um, her, her experience with me was not, was, was not positive. I mean, we had, we, we didn't divorce or anything. We didn't have fights or any, anything like that, but I can see so many times that, that, that I just screwed up the relationship. I mean, we used to live in Santa Fe and had a nice little farm, and I screwed that up. And I could, I could go through. I did in my book go through all of these kinds of things that. I, so, yeah, I think I think that's very possible that it, that a person who has a lot of empathy, I suspect that that it may be true that a person who has a lot of empathy and sees a narcissist thinks that oh well, this is a wonderful guy who's got a lot of potential and maybe I can make make it change. That's probably not. That's probably not going to be true. Uh-huh. And I, if, if, uh, Christ, Christina got a lot of advice before we got married that she shouldn't have anything to do with me. And there were a lot of people who I think recognized they may not have been able to label it at that point, but they knew that there was something going on here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was in therapy with one of the famous therapists, uh, Shelley Cock, who wrote a book, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him, <laughs> which people, which people may know, but it's a, it's a, and my first wife wrote one of the chapters in that book. And I was in therapy with him for a number of years. And in those days, insurance companies would pay for lots of therapy. So we would, I, would, I would see him like uh, three, uh, two or three times a week individually and once a week in, in a group. And uh, finally, he said, I, I had to leave uh, for a couple of weeks because of my business. I was working for the feds and they wanted to send me up to, to uh, uh, Alaska for, uh, doesn't matter why. And he said, if you leave, I won't take you back. And what his and his problem was, I, I, I was all in my head. I couldn't get into feelings. And, and that, that was just, I mean, that, he just felt totally impotent. So he kicked me out. Um, so, you know, I just, I just don't think it's good. I, I, I don't want people to get uh, enthusiastic or optimistic about anything that you can do with narcissism. It's a very strange disorder, and I don't think it's easily treatable. And just because I was fortunate to have the experiences that I wrote about doesn't mean that that can be a universal experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, So all I can say is that people, people who are involved in it one way or another find that they can get some insight by reading my book or writing or talking to me or whatever, I'm very happy to help them. I'm not a therapist. I'm not going to diagnose people. I, I simply express my own experience. Uh, and I think that, that maybe I can be helpful. Maybe I can be helpful with people who are struggling with the whole illusion of self. But yeah. I'm not enlightened either. So I'm, I'm, there's no magic here. Uh, but it is what it is. And so if, if it can be helpful, can it, but... Uh, and come back to your question. I think it's very likely people who are highly empathetic may may have a, enough of an ego situation where they say, "Well, I can I can straighten this guy out." Well, that's probably not true. That probably won't work. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay, because there's a lot there's a lot of those um those combinations going on, I think, and 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 I haven't seen the success in it. So that's why, one of the main reasons I've been excited to um, converse with you um, because I see that dynamic quite a lot. Um, but I wanted to also ask you because you mentioned a few times that you've been so involved in therapy. Um, and of course, uh, we're, we're told, you know, it's kind of a general rule. You're not going to see a, a, a narcissist in therapy. Um, but you, you mentioned, um, your ability to inter, inter, intellectualize, um, what was going on in therapy rather than maybe getting to be in the emotional side of that. So, um, is your experience different or is this just one of those kind of things that we think about and we, we think on, oh, you're never going to see a narcissist in therapy. I don't know why. I think, I think, I think your therapist will tell you, you're never, never going to see a narcissist in therapy. Yeah. There was something about, about my early life and my growing up that I, I felt I would, there, there was something out there. It may have been this, it may have been the, uh, fact that I was raised to be somebody special and I was always looking for what where's the specialness that's very possible but I, I remember in therapy that and I shared this with a ther with a therapist one time and what I what I hoped for was that I would be able to be in therapy and suddenly I would have this experience it would be like walking through an arch and I and suddenly all the problems are gone and, and, and everything's great and of course that never happened and it probably never happens to anybody but I but, People who are successful in therapy are the ones who can get into their feelings and deal with their feelings, and I and I couldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, and um, I had I had one experience that I just discussed in the book after I was thrown out of therapy by Sheldon Cop. I was in therapy uh, with another uh, another therapist, and uh, he was he was quite interesting. And what what he, he did something special for me. Uh, we were in a group, and. Um, a group of men once a week, and he said, uh, well, "Why don't you lead us in a chant?" So I said, "Okay." So I said, "All right, we're going to do good. J Ram, Shri Ram, J J Ram." So I got everybody in the in the group singing J Ram, Shri Ram, J J Ram, and suddenly I started crying, and, and I had never been a crier at all, and I started crying, and I couldn't stop crying until the session was over. And ever since then, it's as though it's as though I unplugged my tear duct or something. I, I mean, I can cry at a Hallmark commercial. It's uh, it's just, it, 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 I don't know. I, it, it, he he opened that up, uh, but it didn't. That didn't open up the, the the empathy. I mean, this is not something that's going to be rapid unless somebody has some sort of a of an epiphany. And yeah. you know, by definition, those aren't something that you can manage. Those are something that happens to you and uh, mm. uh, from a personal point of view um, I think I think that my uh, Zen meditation has probably been very very important to me and how, how crucial that was to all of this experience I don't know but it has been certainly a major part of my life and still is okay awesome so there's a couple of different angles I want to take with you. One is going to be diving into the Zen meditation and um, you know how, what you would suggest with that. But firstly, what I wanted to go to with you um, is still in connection with the last thing that I mentioned with this this dynamic that tends to be at play, a highly empath um, narcissistic person with a highly um, empathic person. Um, and there is this tendency uh, personally that I see where the empathic person is so overly responsible, you know, for the narcissist. And, and like you mentioned, you don't want people to get all excited about how we can have this conversation. It's going to revolutionize narcissism, narcissism, and it's going to completely wipe out the disorder. Um, but instead, you know, I would love to hear your guidance for people who are maybe in relationship with um, a suspected narcissist. Um, and instead of them being overly responsible and trying to be idealistic about this person changing and they're going to be the one who makes the change. How would you um, advise somebody in that dynamic to take responsibility for their own selves um, instead of that over responsibility for the other person and making a shift? I think what a person who's empathetic in a relationship has to do, I think it's very simple. 
they have to recognize that they didn't create the narcissism. They're not going to be able to help them get rid of it. It just is there. And so, and so they need to be understand as much as they can about what it's like. Read the nine and, and get as, in, into as much detail as they want to. Maybe reading my book would be helpful. Maybe there's others that would be helpful. Get an understanding of what it's like to be a narcissist and then be empathetic about it and stay in the relationship because you're getting something out of it, even though you're living with a narcissist. And if you're not getting anything out of it, then get the hell out of there because you're not going to change it. Yeah. So if, if, if it's a relationship that works for you, then be empathetic about the problem, just like you would if the person had a physical disorder. Mm-hmm. But don't expect that you're going to be able to change it. If, if, if it, it changes, great. But that's, I, I don't think that can be ex- easily expected. Does that answer your question? Totally does. Totally does. And I want to ask on on that side as well, because uh, when I was trying to do some research, there is so much content out, content out there to help people recover from narcissistic abuse. Um, but I think I saw like one video out there that was like on, you know, helping the actual narcissist. But I, I still would love to hear your particular wisdom on um, an advice for somebody who has left um, a narcissistic relationship and is struggling with this perception or this experience of feeling abused in that relationship and um, struggling to overcome that and get on with their lives. Um, how would you or what would you advise somebody in, in that particular um, predicament? Well, I think I, I suspect the most the most uh, helpful thing to say is that if you recognize that you that you're living with a narcissist and it's very unpleasant, then 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 leave the relationship. But if you leave the relationship, get into therapy. Yeah. I think that I think there are only two kinds of people in this world: those who have been in therapy and those who could have benefited from it. Mm-hmm. I don't. I I don't. I think that there, there's a I, I would if, if if I could snap my fingers and and make something change that I think would have a, a, a really positive effect on on humanity, I would say everybody needs to have spent some time in a therapeutic situation looking at their feelings, looking at their experience and dealing with it. Yeah. And I think that if you've been in a narcissistic relationship and you decided that that enough is enough, you need to get into therapy and sort it out and get on with your life. Yeah. I mean, you may need to get into therapy even if you decide to stay with the relationship. Yeah. I think Sarah, I, I think, I don't think you can, if you want, if you want going to be creative, I don't think you can avoid therapy, whether you're staying or leaving, if you're, yeah. if you're in this, but I don't think that you can expect that your narcissistic partner is going to have anything to do with therapy. Probably going to be very snot and pleasant if, towards you if you're doing it. So you may have to do it surreptitiously, but of course there's downside to that too. Yeah. Uh, this, my experience is not is, is should not lead people to think there's a bright side to this. Hopefully, my experience is to help people to deal with the, with the dark side and and do something creative. But one of the things that I think is probably tearing a lot of people up is that they think that that um, somehow they can change it. I mean, it, it's. Uh, it's almost, I had never, I've never said this before. I didn't write it, but I, it, uh, it kind of occurs to me. It's almost like, it's almost like uh, living with an alcoholic. And uh, uh, I, I did that. Christina was an alcoholic. And I came to realize that there's only, there's only two things that you can do if you're living with an alcoholic. Buy and pour. <laughs> and, they, and they're going to have to come to their own, they're going to have to come to their own conclusion about it they're they're mm-hmm. going to have to hit base on their own t- on their own terms and i think that's also true of narcissism and it ha- it, it, it isn't there's a there aren't very there there are a very small percentage of alcoholics who really get over it yeah. and there's even much 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 smaller percentage of narcissists so uh-huh. yeah realistic being realistic about this whole thing if you're if you're yeah. in a relationship, working or living with somebody, being realistic about what it's all, what it really means, mm-hmm. and what's reasonably doable is probably the the best advice anybody could give you. Oh my gosh, um, I 
I think you just hit the nail on the head with that. It's all about realism, like, and taking responsibility. Is this what you want your life to be about? You know, instead of the future projected potential and idealism, how about just look at reality and accept Absolutely. this is what it is and you're not going to be able to change that, but what do you want to do with your life and does it suit you to stay or go? And get a therapist it would be, um, I think, some some great supportive um, advice. Absolutely. Awesome. And so let's take that turn. Um, I've been hanging in the back of my head um, about this illusion of self. And I think whether you're a narcissist or you're just a human being, this is such a valuable topic for personal evolution and ending your own suffering. So I'd love to hear from you um, for those of us out there who don't know much about what's, what is Zen Buddhism, uh, uh, what is Zen meditation? Um, how has it helped you particularly? And, um, and how could we get started on a process of um, dropping the illusion of self? That's that's a good question, and that's not an easy one either. I think that there's uh, there's a lot of Zen groups out there that aren't dealing with it either. I mean, it, it's it's at the heart of Buddhism, in, in, in my opinion, and I think other people would agree with me. But it, how how do you deal with it? Um, I'll tell you. Let, let, let's be really simplistic about it. There's a lot of books. There are a lot of books written about it that uh, may or may not be helpful. Um, I think that getting into a meditation, med a daily meditation experience is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important, if possible, to get into a group, a Zen group, a, the, a Sangha in, in, in jargon, but a, a group. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, that um, there, there's, there's one, there's one um, piece of literature that, that is easily attainable for nothing. It's called... Uh, faith in mind, and then you'll find it in, 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 on, in, on Google in faith in mind, or you can or you can use the, the Chinese uh, sing sing ming, s m i n g s m i n g m i n g. Uh, it's just just use the faith in mind English will work. It's about a four page poem, and it's you read it and you think, my God, how can anybody? That doesn't make any sense. And so if you just if you just read that every day and kind of relax and read it and see see how it feels, mm -hmm. I think that that is at the heart of the uh, of the illusion of self. The word self isn't even in it, it isn't there at all. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the the uh, uh, phrases in it that that is uh, kind of off putting when you first hear it. It says, "Don't seek the truth, only cease to cherish opinions." And you read that, and you think, cease to cherish, cherish opinions. How can you live that way? Well, you think about it, and, and, and having opinions is a manifestation of self. And there's, there again, we're talking of some, something of, is at the heart of, of religion, and, we're, and certainly at the heart of Buddhism. And there are no simple, easy answers, and I'm not giving any. But I think if, 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 in terms of process, there are a lot of processes that are work for people but I don't think there's anything that's more that, that is probably more effective or more difficult in many ways than just daily meditation and read and read that poem, which was written by a, 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 a Chinese person named So San in 600 BC. Wow. Back in 600 BC. And it's right at the heart of the matter. Wow. And you can't go wrong. I, at least at least we're not directing anybody in any wrong decisions. You can't go wrong doing those two things. And you make it very, very right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And this is advice for everybody, whether you're you, whatever or go ahead. Actually, actually, I think, I think that it's, uh, you, you don't have to become a Buddhist. And, and I think that, that uh, this is just as available in Christianity as it is in Buddhism. I think that, Actually, this thing I, I reckon is, is not contradictory with, with Christianity, uh, but I don't mean to imply that Buddhism is the only way to drop the illusion of self. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly discussing it with a, with a Christian teacher, if you're a, if you're a Christian, is a... Is a I, th I think that a spiritual path is very important. Everybody either has a spiritual path or they are 
hurting themselves by not having it. But I wouldn't. I don't think it really matters. If you grew up a Christian, be a Christian. Yeah. If you want to change, change to something that feels right to you. But I think it's extremely important to be have a spiritual path, and I think it's in, that it was important to me in my whole struggle and continues to be important to me. Mm. Uh, so I would encourage that. Absolutely, absolutely, and and uh, just add on top of that, you know, because um. Not everybody listening is a part of any sort of religion, but they can still have a spiritual path like you're talking about, um, having a connection to something bigger than just yourself, um, having a philosophy on, on life and, and how that connects with humanity in a positive way. Um, so it's a, yeah. it's a subjective thing. You can be a yeah. member of a church and go to church every Sunday and hang out with the folks and not have a spiritual path. Yeah, I mean, totally. that. Or you, or you decide, or you don't have to be a member of the church, yeah. or, or even believe anything, and you can have a spiritual path. Yeah. Find, find a spiritual path that works for you, and call it whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and I'm not even, well, as a Buddhist, obviously, I, I don't, I don't have a belief in God. I, I don't think there's any. There, there aren't. There's, they all work. They all work. Yeah. And, and. If you if you've grown up with an with a with an aversion to a particular religion, fine. Then find another one. But don't. But find the path that works for you, because that kind of growth, that kind of growth, in, in, in just just look at it in terms of the whole illusion of self. Or read some books on on that, and the, that that illusion of self is is a is a heart of suffering. If you think about it, people want things. They they need things. They want to be loved. They want to be liked. If you if you analyze it, the illusion of self is right at the heart of people's problems. Yeah. But it, it doesn't belong to any particular spiritual path. It's yeah. the heart of all of them, really. Mm, definitely. That's awesome, awesome perspective to share. And I want to ask you um, about how to defend ourselves because I've, I've kind of titled before we even had the conversation, I was like, what angle could we take here? Um and I've kind of titled today's message about narcissistic self-defense. So I think we should touch on it. So my question to you is, how would you advise people to defend themselves from narcissistic abuse, whether they're in a relationship with somebody or not, but just interacting with um, people that they may suspect have narcissism and how do they protect themselves from that? Well, first of all, we're not talking about physical abuse. No. And we're talking about psychological abuse, mm -hmm. and I think the I think the first step is to be has have empathy for the for the for the, what the narcissist is doing. You, mm -hmm. Empathy for him or her. It's usually a him. Yeah. Um, and then and then look at yourself. If if your if, if 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 the actions of this person are driving you up the wall, look at yourself. Look at yourself and and get yourself into therapy. Or get yourself into a into a spiritual practice, so you're so you're working on your own uh, illusions and your own understanding of life and your own increasing your own empathy, and you're not trying to fix somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only way to deal with it. I don't think you can fix somebody else. If you if, if you're having problems with somebody else, then deal with yourself and why. Or to, another way to say it is, nobody nobody can make you mad. Nobody can make you angry. When you get angry, it's because you are allowing that person to to, to, put, to punch, punch your buttons, to make you to to plug into something that you haven't dealt with. If you're totally comfortable with yourself, then somebody can call you the most vile language that you can imagine, and you could say, "Well, that seems inappropriate," but it doesn't mean that you. But you, it's not going to affect you. Totally. So yeah. Be empathetic, and then work on your own problems. If you and, and you'll find that the relationship with the narcissist or whomever you're having to deal with improves. But don't ever, don't ever walk away from the from the ultimate solution to the problem and, and leave the relationship or change the job. Mm -hmm. Every 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 interpersonal relationship is not curable. Uh huh. <laughs> totally. And I like to think of that as you're the common denominator. So you can either, you're just going to take you with you to the next dynamic, the next relationship, find other people that might trigger you or um, make you mad or you're giving your power away. So that's brilliant advice to look to the self. 
and uh, and and use it for your own personal growth journey. I think you that's know, right. You, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, how many? We've all seen people who are on their third marriage or whatever, and it's so interesting how similar all the women. <laughs> Or men are that they have uh, don't. They all have yeah. certain similarity. And then you, yeah. if you're having problems with a relationship, deal with your side of it first and then uh-huh. before you try. I've even seen um, the flip side of that, the other person be totally different. It's like the person's trying to find the opposite, but they're still running into the exact same problems. Yeah, you know, again. Right. So. <laughs> right, Absolutely. exactly. So we have had a number of um, comments that I want to just jump into with you. And um, I also just have a really quick lightning round of questions because I want to respect your time. I know we're going a little bit over, um, but I'd love to just go through these lightning questions with you and then um, and then also just some final words from you. And then we can um, let everybody know like where to find more about you and your brilliant work and um, I've really loved what you've been sharing um, on Instagram is where I came across your work. So we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, but where would you like to go first? Do we want to do comments or do we want to do lightning round questions? Whichever. you. Okay. All right. We'll do some comments quickly. Um, but we had Simon. Uh, so, um, so Sanford was asking, um, how do you drop, get to that point of dropping that? So, what he was talking about was you, what you mentioned about um, getting out of that narcissistic um, tendency. So you mentioned that you need to see it and understand it intellectually. You usually had to hit rock bottom, then understand it intellectually, and then um, and then get to the point where you're going through the therapy and and so forth. So or having the epiphany, I think he was really getting into, um, which is a challenging question to answer i'd say but is there anything else that you had to say about how to get to that point i think the only way to get to it is to, is to set up a process decide what process you know you 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 know you're a narcissist okay so that means that you're going to have to deal with a, a spiritual path you can do without with through therapy or you can do and and therapy is may be a very good way to go or you could get into a practice of, of i think the heart of the matter is that you're going to have to deal with the illusion of self. Yep. And so you're going to have to deal with your illusion of self. And so you're going to have to find the, the path that works for you. Yep. Christian Christianity, definitely. Contemporary Christianity is yep. very heavy stuff. Certainly that works for some people. Buddhism, is that's the heart of the issue in Buddhism. There's a lot, there's a lot of ways to do it, and I'm not saying that one's better than the other, but that's what you have to do. You have to have a path that is geared to it. You have to say, well, look, I'm a narcissist. I know that, and I realize that the, the, the narcissism is really the the illusion of self is right at the heart of narcissism. Okay, we've got that intellectually. Okay, now how am I going to drop that illusion? Mm-hmm. You don't. There's there's, <clears throat> there's no right way. Yeah. Just get just just take that path one way or another. Yeah, love it. And get your book. I think to to read into your journey and get kind of a picture as to how that could play out. For, for you and and just yeah have some trust and faith on that journey for yourself as well um and says i agree there are mul- mul- multiple circumstances that create the narcissism certainly it starts from the child what i find interesting is always their need to, um, to dispel and try to change others view of them and to create flying monkeys that support their effort and enable them further Recovering from being the enabler, loving loving them, stopping from being um, their punching bag, but changing the behavior and standing up to the narcissist is such a challenge. Anything you'd like to say on on what Simon just said? Well, I, it's just I'd say the same thing I just said. I mean, I'm not sure that uh, that standing up to it to a narcissist is something that's necessary. I think the I think. And two things, I think, if you're going to if you're going to have a relationship with a narcissist, whatever the relationship is, you have to be empathetic of his problem, and then you have to be sure that you're. And then you have to start working on your own problem of how of what you're doing about self. Because to the extent that you drop the illusion of self, you're not going to have a problem with a narcissist. It may be a, it may it may not be comfortable. You may find that it's just not pleasant to be around, but it doesn't necessarily make you upset once you. As, as you get into who you are. 
that's so perfectly put. Absolutely, you know, um, and it's I, I I love it because it's empowering people to just take responsibility for how you're showing up and work on yourself with your and, and like you said, if to the extent that you've got the illusion with self is the extent that you're going to be affected by um, somebody in your external world in that way. So absolutely, so so well put. And Simon says. Love it and 100% agree. I do think that at times they are conscious of the damage they inflict and in other times the manipulation is about filling their cups because they don't know how to fill their own. Yeah, Anything that's right. Simon? Yep, perfect. I would question I would question yep. one thing in what Simon said. Yep. I, I really question how, how much a, a, a narcissist is aware. There's, it's, it, it's important to understand that there's a, almost an anesthesia you're going through your your have all this behavior and you don't realize it it's part of your reality yeah. so so you're you're not aware of it but that that may not that's it's not an important point but it, i think yeah. it's true interesting interesting this is all valuable stuff and Simon wants to ask um, for you to explain more around your view of overt and covert narcissism No, I can't do that. I'm, I'm, I have a, I have an experience. I can talk about my own experience. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what the difference would be. I mean, yeah. No, I can't help with that. No problem. Love, I love your transparency and honesty here. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. And, uh, and he also says, you know, boundaries having, what's your, what's your opinion on, um, you know, people just having some good quality boundaries um you know to protect themselves uh from you know any any sort of psychological abuse um do you do you advise anything like that sure we're back to the same thing yeah if, you're, if you could if you can deal with your own self if you could be empathetic to other people and you don't have your own problems to cover up with then, then you're protected i mean if you if you don't have anything to protect if, if you if you say look i'm i'm here i am I'm not covering up with anything. I don't have anything to protect. I don't have anything to prove. Yeah. Nope. Then there isn't any problem. Yeah. And you, so it all, yeah. It all comes back to, yeah. That's the only way you can protect yourself from anybody. You're spot on. And I really, really love you sharing that perspective because um, a way that I um, talk into that and in the work that I do is different. I'm not talking about narcissism, but I'm talking about um, living a life that's true to yourself and there's, you know, at some point when you align with what's actually authentically true for you and you're being guided from the inside out rather than the outside in, you lose this um, connection or attachment to people's perception of you or their judgments on you, um, right. which I think is in total alignment with um, what you just shared. So, um, so much crossover for all areas of our lives, um, what we're talking about right now. Um, awesome. Awesome. And Bill says, great advice. No need to stay in a relationship with a narcissist. Work it out um, without me. I have goals I'm working on, he says. Okay. Um, so, and you mentioned you can do both, you know, like, and, and again, it's leading us back to exactly that same concept of working on yourself and, uh, you know, not having the illusion of self and, and, can, and then making a decision from there. Is this the a dynamic that will work for you? Or is it is it time to move on? Um, but it's coming from a different place rather than escapism from a narcissist that you can't control, who's affecting you so much that you've got that attachment to. Well, it may be that when you finally give up trying to change the narcissist and you realize what's going on, and so then you work on yourself until you're comfortable, you may then look and look and say, "What am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. What what is, why am I doing this?" <laughs> Yeah. And then you can do something else. Okay, totally, totally. I love that. And Tim says, brilliant and giving. I'm grateful. And uh, so thank you, Tim. And Sanford says, you talk about going spiritual, so to speak. What about being so against religion because of the past? So how, yeah. How would oh, religion? One, yeah. What, okay. I'm not talking about belief, mm -hmm. I'm talking about experience. And I'll even go so far, I'll even go way out on a limb here and say that even Christians who believe in God, that's not good enough. You need to experience God. 
And you don't need to believe in Jesus. You need to have an experience. Religion needs to be an experience. And if you've had a bad experience, if you had a bad experience with belief or being bludgeoned into it, fine, walk away from it and try another path. Yep. Um, but don't give up the past. Give up. Yep. Also, it, 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 it'd be a shame to uh, to tar Christianity with your experience in some church somewhere and, and some minister who didn't get it. I mean, don't, don't do that. Uh, if you can find a path that works for you, and if, if, you, if you're totally off on... A particular religion, fine, find another one. Yeah. Uh, but don't don't throw out the baby with the bath because you're only hurting yourself. Yeah. And and would you differentiate um, between because uh, the way I look at it is it's like you can have religion, which is like an organized institution around spirituality, which definitely there's um, works for many many millions and billions of people around the globe. And then there's also um, kind of you can look at spirituality it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to a religion it may very well be um but it could be something separate from religion would you say that that's true i think it's absolutely true everybody who's everybody who's who's involved in the church does not have a spiritual path yes just just joining the church doesn't give you a spiritual path yeah. and you can have a spiritual path and not be part of the church a spiritual path is a spiritual path an, an organization the, when you get it right down to it, an organization, whether whatever it is, a, a religious organization, is for the purpose of helping people with a spiritual with with their spiritual path. Yes. But everybody doesn't do that. I mean, it, it can be just a social thing, yeah. and and that's fine if it works for you. Yeah. But if you're turned off to that, of course you 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 don't you don't have to have a, an organization. It's all it helps to have colleagues. It helps to have people you can talk to. It helps. If, it might help to have a bit a meditation group. Yeah. But if people say, "Well, I'm an atheist," fine. Yeah. So what? I mean, totally. let's get on with it. Yeah. And, totally. But I, I, I don't think organized organized religion is necessarily helpful. But it's not necess It's certainly not necessarily hurtful. Yeah. I mean, it's it is what it is. Yeah. If and, it helps. It helps. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I do think that having having associates having uh, people that, that you can meet with. I, I, I meet with a group of uh, people that are important to me, and I drive 100 miles each way once a week just to hang out with four people. Yeah. Uh, and that's important to me. So, you know, I'm not yeah. – I, I, I value it. I don't feel like I'm sacrificing anything. Yeah. I, but hanging out with those four people is very important to me, yeah. part of my spiritual path. So pick Perfect. one or several and do it. Perfect. And I think you can be more. Be, I, I, I think you can be a member of more than one group that relates to your spiritual. There aren't any. There aren't any absolute ways to do it. Just do it. Totally. And if yeah. one way doesn't work, try another way. Totally. And I think um, a really good uh, thing to talk about here because Sanford mentions uh, being in a cult and people having incredibly negative experiences with this so-called spiritual realm. I guess what you're saying here is. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Find something else that actually supports you on that journey that doesn't have that neg negativity um, or that negative impact on you. Well, let me go out on a limb here and say that if, if, if you get yourself caught up in a cult or something that is destructive to human beings, to you, that's not that doesn't sound to me like a spiritual path. No. So no. Get, leave yes. that and go find one. A lot of things, cults, cults can be very dangerous because they're exploited and they're not, and they're, and they're, you don't want to be part of something that is exploited. And Absolutely. Yeah. So when it looks like it is, yep. split. Perfect. And could you just, for everybody listening, could you just define simply as possible what um, your definition of a spiritual path would be so people can go, okay, well, you know, what, what does that, what is a spiritual path? I think a spiritual path is uh, uh, a process usually involving meditation or for some people involving prayer or both in which you're looking for what, what is the meaning of it all? Who, who am I and what am I doing here? Which I think brings you back to, to looking at the whole illusion of self and what can I do to, to get away from that illusion. Uh, but basically it's um, what's it all about? Love and it. Um, there are lots of ways to come at it. And there's lots of different shortcuts and jargons and everything. I mean, some people are going to 
find that the concept of God and and is very very valuable and very important, and some people are going to have a, a deep experience without it. Uh, we don't have to judge what other people are doing. We just need to find what works for us. Yeah. And so there's lots of choices. Awesome. I appreciate you um, going deeper on that because I think it's a really important topic, um, particularly for a lot of my audience. So um, really appreciate that. And last little comments here. Um, Tim says, empowering to hear your distinction from other conditions and also the valuable lesson of awareness of self-illusion that living um, with a narcissistic personality um, offers. So yeah, that's, that is really powerful what you shared with us about that. And uh, thank you, Tim. Um, Tim just says, what is next for you looking forward from today? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what's really, what I'd really like to do. I, I would, I would like to take some of the experiences that I've been having like, like this and some people's ideas and some of my own ideas that I've, that have come out of this. And I would like to, to either probably, it would probably be more helpful than writing a book to expand this one and have it, and have it republished with some more helpful stuff. Cause I think that, that there's a lot of things that have, that, that could be added to it that would be helpful to people. So I may do some more writing. We'll see. Amazing. Amazing. Well, we'll look forward to it. Um, and you're definitely going to get a few book sales after today's session, um, including one from me. Um, so I'll really look forward to diving into that. So are you ready just for some really quick, short, sharp um, lightning round questions? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. The first one is, what do the words limitless potential mean to you? Oh, it, it means that, um, well, I, I, I'll tell you what, we're back to the same thing. Literally, once, once, if, you, if, you can, if you can totally drop the illusion of self, then there's no difference between you and, and the experience of the Buddha, and that's pretty limitless. Mm, awesome, awesome. And what is something you believe that other people think is insane? Oh, I think that um, I think people when you start talking about uh, the illusion of self being the, the cause of all suffering, I think most people think that's pretty insane. <laughs> Definitely, unfortunately, yeah. And what book have you given most as a gift? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what most book have I seen? I. Uh, <laughs> I think I think it's um, the um, the writings of uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj, which was a uh, uh, an, an Indian guru who just simply uh, sat and talked to people, and some people put his ideas together. Um, that that's uh, I don't know. That's I, I don't have a very good answer to that question. No, that's good. That's good. I, I thought you were going to say your own book, um, but you know that's that's good. Um, interesting. And uh, what do the first sixty minutes of your day look like? I, I get up and uh, go to the bathroom and sit down and meditate for. I mean, that's that's actually the, the routine. And I sit down and I meditate for sixty to to forty to sixty minutes. Mm, awesome, awesome. Okay. And what obsessions do you explore in the evenings or on the weekends? Obsessions. What am I obsessed with? Hmm. I'm just, I don't, well, I guess, um, I, I guess, I guess the, the kinds of things of, uh, uh, I pay a lot of attention to my to to keeping thin and my weight, and that's an obsession. And uh, but I but I like it. I'm not going to change it. I, I I'd, I'd rather do that. Um, I I don't think I don't think obsessions are a big problem for me at this point. Good. I, one of one of the obsessions that I really enjoyed was smoking, but I haven't smoked in <laughs> 25 years. I've always joked and said if they, if 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 I knew that there was a uh, an asteroid coming in and going to destroy the planet and it's going to be gone in six weeks, I'd probably go out and buy a box of cigars. But <laughs> the, no, I don't really have any big obsessions. 
No, that's great. That's a good answer. And I know we were discussing beforehand, you mentioned you were 85 years old and I double took because I was like, oh, hang on, how do you have such great health here? So now we can kind of understand, you know, that that's, that's important for you to really maintain and look after your health. Well, I think that my, I'm fortunate. I, I got a good dose of genes. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any comorbidities. I don't have anything wrong with me. Yeah. And that's not, that's, I, I, I live a pretty clean life, but you know, I, I, I have a, I have a couple of cocktails every night and I, and I suppose you could say there that, that I have to consciously decide, no, I'm not going to have that third one, but <laughs> um, that's, I, I, my, my ability to be healthy at 85 is not something that I can take credit for. I, I was just uh, in the front row when they were passing out the positive genes. I, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you did well. You did well. Or whoever did well in that, in that line of genetics. It's awesome. And what topic would you speak about if you were asked to give a TED Talk on something outside of your main area of expertise? You mean outside of what we're talking about now? Yeah. Oh, if I were if I were asked to give a TED talk, I would I would um, I would talk about this whole this whole um, problem of spiritual path and and, and self. Mm -hmm. I think I think if I, I, if you uh, look at it in a macro way, you can look at the, at the television or whatever, and you can look at the problems that are that are existing nationwide. It, it's well. The, you can't you can't blame this on on the on the on the virus, but you can you can blame it on how we're dealing with it. It all relates. It all relates to self. It all relates to self. And and if it if if everybody were and and this isn't going to happen. I'm not expecting it to. But if everybody started working on that, it would it would dramatically change the planet. But we're we're homo sapiens and we've got a whole mixture of, of, of attitudes and feelings and everything and, and people can be involved in a lot of, of unnecessary suffering and not want to deal with it but yeah. uh, if I were going to do a TED talk I would do it on on what people can do to deal with that that major issue because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that there's probably a lot of interest out in, in, in the in the world for for what what causes suffering and what do I do about it yeah. And I think there's some answers that are not hard to understand and that would be worth talking about. Awesome. I hope you do get asked to do that TED Talk. I'd be, I'd be definitely listening in. And uh, do you have a quote that you live your life by or think of often? Yeah, I, I do, actually. There's, I think about this quite often. There's a, there's a, uh, a phrase that comes from the, the uh, Faith and Mind um uh, uh, the poem I was talking about, it says, uh, don't seek the truth, only cease to cherish opinions. Yeah. And mm. when I first heard that, I thought, what? what is, that's crazy. I grew up in a very, very opinionated family. And I spent most of my life with extreme opinions. But when you start thinking about what, are, what would happen if you, if you just watched what was happening in the world and you did what, you, what, what made sense to do at the time from deciding what you were going to have for dinner and stuff, who you're going to vote for for president, but you did it without without a lot of opinions. Just that 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 statement is uh, it sounds ridiculous, but it's very very deep if you really get into it. I think that's my favorite quotation. You, I feel like it's come close to the top of my favorite quotes right now. With after you mentioning it, it's something I really want to sit with. So, thanks for sharing that one. Um, what is the worst advice you see or hear being dispensed in the realm around narcissism? narcissism? Oh, I, I think I don't I, I, I don't know the answer to that because I don't have a I don't have a lot of experience with with hanging out with narcissists and I don't want to I don't want to uh, have act as though I know something I don't know I don't know that <laughs> yeah well that would go don't, against your favorite quote wouldn't it yeah <laughs> I love that's it. right <laughs> Okay, and if you could have one gigantic billboard um, anywhere with anything on it, what would that gigantic billboard say for people to see? Just sit. Uh huh. <laughs> that, that that's that's that that comes out of, of Zen Buddhism. That that's the basic 
thing. People are always saying that, you know, don't, you don't have to read a bunch of books. You don't have to do just sit. Uh -huh. And I want to by just sit. I mean, meditate every morning. Yeah. Love it. Perfect. And how has an, a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Or do you have a, fa a favorite failure of yours? Yeah, I think the, fa the, the failure that I had uh, throughout my life was of, of not, not uh, settling in and making a success of what I was doing, but walking away to do something else and, and constantly looking for something that wasn't there. And um, I think that um, it, it almost doesn't matter. I, at this point, I would say it almost doesn't matter what you do as long as you do it in a successful and satisfying way. There's no... There's, there, there, I, I see. I, I've, I've been a, I've been a recruiter uh, for um, 25 years, and we place people in healthcare. And I get people. I was a, a woman who is a, a director of nurses, and she, in, a, in a nice hospital, and she decided that she wants to go to something bigger. Or some guy who has got a job, and now he wants to go into it. And I often think, well, why? What? What? What's the matter with what you, what you're doing, I and mean, why do you want to leave? And there, there's there's a tremendous urge in our in our culture, I think, in, in the United States, for people to want to, always want to be going to something new. Somehow they they reach the point where, as though if if you keep climbing the ladder, there's something at the top of the ladder, and I'm not sure that's true. Uh huh. And so your experience of jumping from the one thing to the next to the next was the failure that led you to the success, more successful or satisfying result of being able to stay in something that you enjoy or finding that joy? Yeah, the, this job that I have now of, of, of this, this company that I have of, of doing recruiting, I started that in 1967. Yeah. And, I've been, and I've been living in the same house, doing the same job since 1967. And, and everything before that, I may have lived in one house after I left. Even even when I was growing up, I probably never lived in the same house for five years. And after I left home, it was it was one or two years. And I've never had the same job more than more than a year until until that changed. And then I've, I've been in the same situation for twenty three years. Yeah. I I don't think I I I think that hopping around from house to house or from job to job. Uh, probably is not the most creative way to live. Okay, cool. Love it. Love it. And the final just quick question is what have you changed your mind about in the last few years and why? Okay, well, I think I think there's there been, there's been a lot of a lot of changes that have come to me uh, as in the last few years as a result of this this uh, narcissistic thing and uh, uh, I, I, I guess one of the major changes is a is much more of an openness. Um, much um, I, I I used to um, I used to have I used to always have a strong opinion about everything and and a strong answer to everything. And uh, I'm I think that's part of the biggest change that uh, I don't have the answers. I don't I don't know what's right. I I know what makes sense for me now, but uh, I'm always there's I'm, I'm I'm open to growth, and I think that I think it's very easy to get into a ideology or into a rigid situation or uh, and and stay with it. And uh, uh, that's one of the things that I think um, is a problem that we have in the, in, the, in the United States right now. Is we've just got a whole bunch of ideologies and 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 positions that people think are absolutely the truth and everybody else is wrong. And so we end up with a very uh, uncomfortable situation for most people because it's, it's, we used to be, we used to be a melting pot. Now we're a salad bowl, a salad bowl of ideologies. And, and it, 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 it's not the same. It's not comfortable. Yeah, totally, totally. And very connected to this illusion of self or the attachment to self. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. That's, that's mm. every, everybody's little ideology is the way to have is the way to find truth. Yeah. Well, good yeah. luck. That's it. That's it. Oh wow. Well. Okay. And I'd love um, for you to share with everybody listening um, where they can find out more about you and um, and where they. I've, 
I've just put your website um, just on on the screen for people to see um, the recoveringnarcissist.org. Is there anywhere else? I know your books on Amazon, uh, the Zen Recovering Narcissist. Where else can people find you? My profile on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And um, that's 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 everything I think. Perfect. In terms of finding out about me, yeah. Okay, and and I like your Instagram page because that's how I came across you, and I feel like you you put out really valuable content. Um, every everything that I see from you, I always read, and um, I'm always intrigued and and get some good perspective from it. So I want to invite people to check out your Instagram page as well, and I think that's under the Zen Recovering Narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and any final words that you have to share with everybody listening? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, only, the final word I would have is that I, w- I really welcome comments. And uh, if uh, as I do these kinds of things, which I, I suppose I will do when I am asked to, uh, I'd like to hear if, if, if people find that something that I've said is particularly helpful or if I've said something or that, that people book a question and, and I'm happy to rethink it. I think there's a dynamic there. And uh, um, if I can be helpful to somebody by talking to them or sharing with them, I'm, I'd like to do that. So absolutely. Uh, that's all I guess I can add. Perfect. Perfect. And yeah, I totally agree. There's something about the co-creation of, you know, getting feedback from your audience and, and having those questions or those comments so that you can make it more of a dialogue. And it's a way that we, we all kind of grow and get a, a more expanded perspective on reality as well. So um, yeah, so people have been dropping comments. Um, I'll make sure you know that you know where this video is so that you can respond to people's comments and things like that as well. And they can obviously reach out to you. Um, so, and Sanford says, yes, very helpful talk. Thank you. Um, so that's great. We've got some great positive feedback going on there. And um, I just wanted to, before we t- wrap up today's call, I just wanted to thank you so, so much for spending your time with myself and with the Limitless Potential community and adding your wisdom and your value and yeah, just really acknowledge you for the human being that you are and the work that you've done and how you share from such a genuine place and really walk your talk. Uh, with everything that you share. So just wanted to shout that appreciation out and I'll look forward to having a conversation with you at any stage. Whenever you want to have another chat, um, you're always most welcome back um, or if you have anything, any work that you want to talk about at any time. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. It's been very uh, enjoyable for me and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. So for everybody listening, um, I really hope that this has been of tremendous value to you and it's inspired you to reach for a new level of your limitless potential and make sure that you um, drop any comments for Larry. You reach out to Larry, check out his book. We'll be reading it alongside one another. And uh, for any of you who want to continue the conversation afterwards, I really invite you to join the Limitless Potential Inner Circle Facebook community. And we'd love to have you there in there as well, Larry. Um, so it's just a free group I'll shoot you a message Um, but that is it from us today guys thank you so much for showing up and especially to you Larry Um, thank you so much again for your time and as I always tell everybody go out there live authentically love deeply and contribute meaningfully any final words? thank you perfect thanks again and uh, see you soon good